I pray for protection over the nation of Israel. And I pray that you give them supernatural power, glory, and strength to defend and, and defeat the enemies that are coming against them who would love to see them annihilated, Father God. They're not a perfect nation by any means. They're not a bunch of angels. That's not what I'm here to say. You know what I mean? I'm not here to just say, oh, the Jews are just get a free pass because they don't. And the Bible talks about that. And so I find it corny for people who up till recently, people that have never talked about Jews or Palestinians. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm saying I think I find it ironic that in the city that I live in, I'm seeing Palestinian flags flying around, you know, I th and I, I just I'm sort of jaded, but I think. I've been in this city my whole life. I don't remember meeting pro-Palestinian people at all, ever. So we got to watch out with obsession. And, and Archmages already touched on this. I, I love that. That to me is like confirmation. But seemingly good things can also become an obsession. And this is dangerous. Okay, so I touched on this last week. Religion versus relationship. The actual religion side of following Jesus, meaning whatever traditions you practice or things you do with, let's say, the church you go to, or how many times a week you go to church, or how many Bible studies you go to, or how many times you pray or read, the things or the tools that you use to worship God, those can become an idol. <laughs> and you can find yourself in this self-righteous spirit of religion. Religion appeals to our flesh just the way other sins appeal to our flesh. Religion in that sense of saying, I'm such a good boy, I deserve a pat on the head because of all the good things I do, pursuing it for that is a fleshly thing. That's wanting to add your justification to righteousness. And remember, the Bible teaches we are righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross. I could spend the rest of my life doing all the good things that I possibly could, and cutting out, you know, as much sin from my life as I could and being a good boy at the end of the day, that's not going to make up for all my past sins that I committed. And I'm still, you know, I could spend the rest of my life being a good boy and that's not going to save me. Okay. So we have to check ourselves even in that guys. And you see this in Christians in self-righteous, unforgiving, judgmental Christians, um, and, and, and it can be detrimental to drawing people into Christ. You know what I mean? Remember, the gospel means the good news. Um, and so we have to it's balance and we have to be aware of this. The enemy will attack through a religion. OK. All right. Well, let's jump to Esther 4, 7 through 14. <laughs> Sorry. So we're actually in Esther 4, 8. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susan for their destruction, talking about the Jews, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to, spoke to Hatach and commanded him to go to the Mordecai and say, so this is Queen Esther saying this to her cousin Mordecai, the Jew, and she's a Jew too. All, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will, will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Uh, Haman, the guy who's upset with Mordecai, issues a decree that on a said date it's put into law that the jews are allowed to be annihilated he makes a law saying on this day we are going to go and and kill all the jews not just mordecai right this is stemming from his irritation towards mordecai but him being a powerful man issues a decree saying 
we're going to kill every Jew, <laughs> not just Mordecai. We're going to kill all the Jews. And he issues this decree. So Mordecai is the cousin of Esther. Esther is the queen who's won favor with um, this foreign king. She basically won a beauty contest and um, the queen, uh, the king likes her a lot. So Mordecai goes to her and essentially says, you got to say something to the king. And Esther is saying, I can't freely just walk into the king. Remember, these are ancient times, and I looked this up a little bit, but there were cultures like this where, like it said, if you just go into the king's court or palace unannounced or without an invitation, you could be killed, right? So she's telling Mordecai, like, I can't really get to him easily. Um, I, you know, I risk being killed if I do. So she's in a catch-22, sort of. She's like, I don't know what to do. Um, later, we see that she entices the king by standing out in front of his quarters or wherever he, wherever he lives and he does hold the golden scepter out to her and then she's able to invite him <clears throat> to a banquet that she's holding and this is how she gains more access to the king um but my note for this is we are all put into situations both big and small in which we will have to make a hard decision to do the right thing here we see Esther potentially jeopardizing her whole position by telling the king about the Jews and potentially losing her life, you know. Um, Mordecai refusing to bow down to Haman led to Mordecai persecuting not only Mordecai, but the entire Jewish people. Um, this really struck me, you know, and I thought, wow, Lord, like, A, thank you, Lord, that I'm not in a position where literally my life is currently hanging in the balance uh, for following you. Um, you know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> the way things are going, you know what I mean? Who knows if one day we'll be persecuted like this again. But for the time being, I'm like, like, even if I stand up for you now, Lord, like I'm not really in jeopardy of just flat out death, you know? Um, but there's a million other situations in my life where I find myself sitting there confused or not confused, but I'm at a crossroads and I know what the Lord wants me to do. I know what the Bible wants me to do. Um, and I know what my flesh and my sin want to do. Oftentimes my flesh and my sin want to choose the path of least resistance and God's ways oftentimes are, are saying, I don't want you to choose the path of re least resistance. So I highlighted this because I want us all to sit and think for a moment, just like <clears throat> where in my life do I need to make a stand for God? You know what I mean? And I might have to jeopardize a relationship, a position at work, finances, a million things that you may be fearful to lose or, or be taken from you if you make a stand for Christ. And <clears throat> the temptation is great to to back down right again this whole like i don't want to rock the boat and uh you know whatever all these excuses that we may not like stand up for christ or or choose the right thing and so I j i'm just asking you you know as we go through the bible study and after the bible study think about this in your life is the lord calling you you know to some situation or circumstance where you're like i know what god wants me to do that in this and i'm afraid it's okay. It's totally natural and normal. And I'm here to tell you, do the right thing. As we see in this story, it, it, it pays off. Um, and it, it works out for God's glory. And, and the Jewish people are delivered, you know, in this very elevated, dramatic situation. But we can find ourselves in equally um stressful situations for us you know where we're at in our life and what's going on in our family or at work or with our friends where we're like oh man this this decision i might lose a friend or this decision might not make me popular with the boss or whatever but again i'm here to encourage and tell everybody your first and number one boss is is jesus god the lord and if you honor him he will honor you he was he's always faithful to deliver you know and that's part of the message of this bible study when we seek god when we follow god when we give our life to god when we make the hard decisions for god he is going to turn our situations around for good and for his glory and i don't know the timing on that sometimes it's not overnight sometimes it's not in a week 
Sometimes it's not in a month. Sometimes it's not in a year. But we endure through these hard choices. And we have faith that somehow, you know what I mean? Because I honored God and did the right thing because I love him and I want to. In his miraculous, all-knowing way, he is going to turn it around for us, which we see directly in this story. Mordecai and Esther are in a bad situation, and she takes the risk or the gamble, I guess, of doing the right thing, and, and God turns their situation completely around. Like in this picture that's behind me or on the screen, number six at the bottom in the middle of the screen, this is where the story pivots. Um, so let's actually go to that verse in the Bible. So this is X, Esther 6, 6 through 13. So Haman came in and the king said to him, um, this real quick. So Mordecai, the king didn't realize that Mordecai is the one who saved him earlier in the story from two of his royal guards that were planning to murder him. And Mordecai never really got honor or credit for this and the king is finding this out later so this is what the king is talking about to haman the guy who hates mordecai so haman came in and the king said to him what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor and haman said to himself whom would the king delight to honor more than me right so he's thinking he's got to be talking about me and haman um and Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, and that the robes and the horse be handed over to, the, to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor." Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. A burn. So Haman took the robes and the horses and dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning, and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife, Zeresh, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, If Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast uh, that Esther had prepared but burn so here Haman thinks he's going to get honored and exalted <laughs> I love it and the way this is written is so awesome and then he's the king says so what should we do for this guy and he he has the plan he's he's thinking this will be done for him right that he, that he'll be dressed in royal robes and that he'll sit on the king's horse and he'll be paraded through the city as a great man and the king says awesome do it to essentially his arch enemy, the guy he hates and is persecuting, right? Um, this is where our faith can come in that this is what I, I feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to me this week in my personal studying. If I'm faithful to God and I work on my relationship with Christ and I work on cutting out sin from my life and I work on doing the right things with my time and my energy, no matter how hard it may be, in the present God is going to turn my situation around and he's going to turn your situation around and again there's no deadline on this I, I wish I could say you know do the right thing right now and tomorrow you're gonna wake up and it's all gonna be changed it's a process that could happen something could turn around quick you know in the scheme of this story this all happened seemingly pretty quick um, but for others of us this might be a long weeks months years process before we see our turnaround before we see the story pivot and it's going to require us seeking the lord um day in and day out despite our feelings um despite our doubts despite our fears as we give to god he's going to give to us 
That's just how our God works. He's a good God. He has promises. Um, he has conditional promises in the Bible. If you follow me, <laughs> things will go well for you. Boom. Straight up. And some of us have, may have dug ourselves into holes. Me. Okay. Big or small. Some of us might be going through a small trial. Some of us might be going through the trial of the lifetime and anything in between. But I'm here to tell you, as you seek God and stay faithful to him, the almighty God of this universe is going to turn your situation around. And we can rest in that. On the dark days, the hard days, we can rest in that knowing that God knows everything that's going on in this situation. You know what I mean? If I'm faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to me. Amen, dude. And that gives me so much peace. And I hope it gives you guys that, that same peace. You know, that's from the word of God. And we can stand on that. And Mordecai and Esther's story is an example of this. Um, and I wanted to bring this up because, or I want to bring this verse up, Matthew 20. Was it Matthew? Okay, I, I got to trust myself. Yeah, Matthew 23, 12. And Jesus said this, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's how sin, um, that's how humbleness and pride work, ladies and gentlemen. It's that simple. If you exalt yourself and have pride, God's going to humble you. And if you humble yourself, God's going to exalt you. No need to overthink it. Just have faith in that and work on being humble if you're not a humble person. And I'm talking in all things. God is fighting our battles for us behind the scenes or in the spiritual realm that we cannot always see. Again, when we're faithful to him, we have no idea what's being unleashed in the spiritual realm and what he's doing to work for the good in our lives. And again, those dark days, those long days where it's like seemingly nothing's going right, nothing's turning around. That's where the faith comes in. Um, like it was said of Jesus, he's long suffering. There's going to be times and periods in our lives, God, guys, where we have to be long suffering. The relief is not going to be instant. The turnaround is not going to be right away, but there is going to be a turnaround. Okay. And this, you know, has to do with humbleness. Um, it's something I've talked about in other YouTube videos that you could go find, but I struggled with arrogance, ego, pride for the majority of my adult life. And it wasn't only until I got out of rehab a few years ago that God broke and humbled me for the first time in my life. <clears throat> and he had to do something dramatic and punish me for, to get my attention. So I want to share that part of my testimony in the sense that guys don't be stubborn like Steve you can you can get off the train you're on right now whatever degree of darkness or badness or sin that you're in i promise you the sooner you get off the train the, the less bad the train wreck's going to be because like i said earlier sin only leads to a train wreck all right and so the sooner you can get off the train the better because it's going to it's going to crash and burn. Sin never never promises on, on it never delivers on what it promises, okay? Um okay, so two things like I said, the title of these notes are Modern Framing of Israel and Palestine. All right, as I read this, it spoke to me not only about my individual life and that God is going to turn things around for me, both big and small. Um, but we see this theme of Israel's enemies wanting to annihilate and destroy them. It's still going on today. We just saw it this last weekend. Iran expressly wants to kill the Jews from the river to the sea. This is where I want to connect this epic ancient battle to Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4 going back in the old testament this is mind-blowing and the lord showed me this one about almost a year ago where i made this connection in my studying it blew me away and it cleared up like a lot 
about how I view the state of Israel, like the literal nation of Israel and the state of Israel because of what they're going through. But let's see Deuteronomy verse or Deuteronomy chapter nine, verse four. And this is God talking to the Jews. Do not say in your heart after the Lord, your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you, not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart. You are going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is epic. God promised the nation of Israel thousands of years ago that he would never leave them or abandon them. He knew that Jesus would go, was going to come from their bloodline, right? The savior of the world came through the Jewish people. He's God's sacrifice and gift to all of humanity. So Israel, the Jews will always be, the Bible says they're the apple of his eye. That term that people use for like a father and his son, right? You might've heard that before, like uh, a father and son or a father and daughter or a mother and son, whatever, when a parent loves their child so much, you, you might've heard this saying, like he's the apple of his father's eye. It means his father loves him more than anything in this world. Like a good father does. Well, God loves his, his people the way a good father would love his son. He loves the nation of Israel. Just like this verse said, it is not, because of their righteousness or the uprightness of their hearts. It's because God promised the nation of Israel has turned their back on the Lord throughout the old Testament and currently modern Jews who don't accept Christ. That's a rejection of him. And we don't have enough time to get into it. Um, in this Bible study, what I want to say is just because you're a Jew, does not mean you're automatically saved ah, and going to heaven. Of... Um, and that's a whole other topic that's discussed in the Bible. What I am saying is God is never going to abandon the nation of Israel. And we just have to, uh, we, you have to get over it. It's just a promise that he made. And again, the nation of Israel has turned their back on God at times, <clears throat> but God has never ultimately turned his back on the nation of Israel. My pastor said this once of all those ancient people from the old Testament, the nation of Israel is the only one that's still left standing in it's in its ancient form. You know, they're still the Israelites, the Jews, all their enemies from the ancient times <clears throat> in, and even though there's ancestral lines, but none of those other nations survived. Is that a coincidence? I think not. God made a promise a long time ago, and it's going to be ultimately seen through um, in the battle of Ar Armageddon and at the end of the age and the end of the world. And the connection that we can make, guys, in our individual lives, here is where it all kind of connects. The whole history of the nation of the Jews is a metaphor for our individual lives and walks as Christians. Remember, it's not because of my uprightness of heart or my righteousness that God is going to save and deliver me from sin and death. It's simply be because he loves me. And it's simply our duty, our responsibility, our acknowledgement of that. That is what the sinner's prayer is. When you get on your knees and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please save me. That's, <laughs> that's the gospel. And he says, if you do that, I will save you. Right? And so just like the way the nation of Israel has been a rebellious nation, and again, you would have to study the Old Testament, but they go through periods of following God, turning away from God, following God, turning away from God, following God, turning away from God. They're not a perfect nation by any means. They're not a bunch of angels. That's not what I'm here to say. You know what I mean? I'm not here to just say, oh, the Jews are just get a free pass because they don't. And the Bible talks about that. And I'm no angel. I've gone through my ups and downs in my life. There's been times that I've walked close to the Lord. There's been times that my faith has been dead and I turned my back on the Lord. Um, 
And that's how our sin is. You know what I mean? We go through victories and then we go through defeats and it's this cycle that we're in. And sometimes we have some victory over a sin and then maybe a few years it, it rears its ugly head again. And we find ourselves in that same battle and we're like, I thought I was over this sin and we stumble again. Um, it's not because of our righteousness. It's because of God's promise and love for us. All right. And, uh, that has been very eye opening and encouraging to me. Um, I just want to bring up a few facts about the Jews and the Palestinians, but archaeologic and genetic data support that both Jews and Palestinians came from the ancient Canaanites who extensively mixed with Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Anatolian peoples in ancient times. Thus, Palestinian Jewish rivalry is based in cultural and religious, but not in genetic differences. Interesting. And that corroborates the Bible. All right. Again, if you study the Old Testament, um, th this statement here by um, some historical scholar, that's shown to be true in the Bible. You know what I mean? So you can really look at this as this is an ancient rivalry that's been going on a long, long time. And so I find it corny for people who up till recently, people that have never talked about Jews or Palestinians. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm saying I think I find it ironic that in the city that I live in, I'm seeing Palestinian flags flying around, you know? I, and I, I just, I'm sort of jaded, but I think I've been in this city my whole life. I don't remember meeting pro-Palestinian people at all, ever. Do you know what I mean? It's not like throughout my life, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember John. He was really pro-Palestinian. Unless maybe I ever met a Palestinian, then you could just assume, well, yeah, he's a Palestinian. Of course he loves Palestinians. Same, I, I, I could say the same with the Jewish side. Like if you see the Star of David or their flag, I'm like, suddenly everyone loves the Jews. This, this is the enemy's partly using this as another way to divide us for sure. Um, I want it to be known. Like, I don't want the Palestinians to all be murdered and killed. Um, <clears throat> I don't think every Palestinian is pro Hamas um, and, and thinks the way Hamas thinks, you know, um, I don't want terrorists to go into israel and kill babies right i don't want that bloodshed either like ark may just said at the top of the thing like i'm not for war i don't want to see all this happening but unfortunately like in my spirit like i know it is um i know it is going to happen and the bible prophesies that it's going to happen you know um so uh the palestinians uh, come from the ancient Canaanites, okay, both Jews and Palestinians at some point, like they have a very long and complex bloodline, but like in a general sense, they came from the Canaanites and what the Canaanites represent. Um, these are people of the land and the ones that it will require God's strength to conquer. This is speaking of them in the ancient times during the Exodus and the wilderness period. This is speaking of when the Jews came out of Egypt, they also, the Canaanites also serve as a threat to the re religious purity of the Israelites. Their polytheism and godless living held out a temptation um, to the devotion to the God of Israel. Okay. The Bible characterized the Canaanites as idolatrous and immoral because they practiced polytheism, the worship of multiple gods. The Canaanite religion featured worship of the serpent supreme deity el and his partner asherah all right and this is even talked about in the bible how the jews would turn their back on the one true god and they would set up asherah poles and worship pagan gods okay and needless to say um god hates that um almost done a few other points i want to make i know this is a long one but i think it, it it's very near and dear to me because the lord has like revealed this stuff to me through my prayer and individual Bible study. He's revealed things to me and he's given me answers on stuff, you know, and I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. Um, 
but I kind of skipped around, but I want to connect real quick back to this idea of us sinners, us Christians who are sinners and struggle with our sin. This verse gives me a lot of comfort. Um, we're going to Luke 18, 9, and this is Jesus, or yeah, this is Jesus. So he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So again, um, guys, it's nothing in our own sinful nature that we did to save ourselves. And that needs to be a thing we remember on the daily and this is how we approach people and non-believers. You know, in, in meeting someone or even in the people in your life that you know, fellow other believers or non-believers or strangers or whatever, people close to you or not, we have to be in a place of humbleness and love. That's where it starts, man. And our sinful nature, to be quite honest, is prideful and it doesn't like humbleness and it doesn't like love. Our sinful nature likes warring. Our sinful nature likes pride. And we always have to, like, check ourselves. And some of us struggle with it worse than others. It's a particular hard battle for me being the arrogant, I'll just say it, douchebag that I've been for the majority of my life, man. I, re I really have been. Sorry to say douchebag, but it's true. And all I can say is I'm grateful that God revealed this to me before I died. That's all I can say, you know, and now I can spend the rest of my life, whether it be one more day and I die tomorrow or I live to be 80 years old or anything in between. I can spend the rest of my energy on seeking God, seeking um, goodness, healing from my sinful past and life that I led. You know what I mean? Like <clears throat> I can go forward from here and have peace. Like I said, whether I die tomorrow or or I die in 40 years, I am grateful God has <clears throat> showed this to me. The Battle of Gog and Magog. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but it is a prophecy in um, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. Um, some very intelligent um, scholars, theologians, pastors um, believe that this what's going on with Israel and Iran and the surrounding nations, this could potentially be this prophecy of the battle of Gog and Magog. Now, some of the pastors I like very much will say, I'm not saying that this is the battle of Gog and Magog, but um, you can see how this potentially could be the beginning of the battle of Gog and Magog. And basically that prophecy says that Russia along with um, some Arab nations. I can't remember who. I'll do my research between now and next week. But Russia will team up with Muslim Islamic nations to come against Israel. Israel will be left alone. Basically, all nations will turn their back on Israel to fight this um, battle by themselves. They will be greatly outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, obviously, like just like in any old street fight. You know what I mean? If it's two versus one, the odds are in favor of the two guys versus the one. If it's five versus one, you know what I mean? So this prophecy states that many nations are going to come against Israel at the same time. And, you know, the Bible says it'll look like it's over for Israel, but God will deliver Israel through a great earthquake so that all the nations will know that God, this God, the one true God of the Bible, that us Christians stand on, 
that his glory and power will be made known to the world. It'll be such a dramatic thing. Just think of that. If that happens, everyone, you would think men are very rebellious and sinful. But if that happens in our lifetime and we saw it, you know what I mean? I, 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 would, I can't help but think, I'm like, Lord, there are a bunch of people would have to come to you. It would almost be obvious. Unfortunately, that's probably not even true. But um, that's why a lot of uh, Christians have their eyes on this and they're studying it and they're reflecting on it because they're like, so far, this could be the beginning of this this battle. Um, but yeah, I won't get into the details of it. I just give you like a preview for next week. It's a It's a good one. And it's potentially contemporary and potentially what's unfolding before our eyes, which is very uh, exciting as a Christian. And it's it's scary, too. You know, it really is. It's, it's unbelievable. All right, guys, that's it. Father God, thank you so much for this night. And um, thank you for Archmages. And thank you for anybody else who may have been watching this but just not commenting. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them. I pray that they would reflect on what's been talked about in this Bible study. And I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself and the truth to them in their own individual lives and walks. Um, I thank you for this night, Lord. And I want to pray for the nation of Israel um, and, and just the world in general, Lord. I see a lot of conflict and pain and insecurity going on father god and ultimately i do pray for peace in israel god and i pray that you deliver your people and i pray that jews who don't believe in you lord i pray that their eyes would be opened their ears would be opened, their hearts would be opened <clears throat> and they would come to the true saving knowledge of jesus christ god they're your original physical people that you love lord and i pray that you save a lot of them i pray that through all these crazy circumstances they see you lord jesus as the one true god the one to seek the one to follow the messiah the savior all of it all your promises that are true i pray that your jewish people would see that father god i pray for protection over the nation of israel and I pray that you give them supernatural power, glory, and strength to defend and, and defeat the enemies that are coming against them who would love to see them annihilated, Father God. Thank you for this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>